topics that we're going to go over. We have um, the HIPAA, privacy and security. We have Medicare fraud. And we have customer service. And I'll be doing um, the HIPAA and the Medicare one. And um, Candace, so Amber and mm -hmm. Candace will be doing the customer service one. Um, so we're going to start out with HIPAA privacy. And that's been um, here for a while now. And um, we've been doing it, this in service, pretty much every year since we were supposed to. <laughs> and. Um, so this is one of your every year in services that we will have to talk about. Um, it was enacted in 1996 and it has three main purposes. Uh, the first one is to protect people from losing their health insurance if they change jobs or have a pre-existing health condition. So when you leave employment, um, you can keep your health insurance for 18 months. That gives you time to look for something else. Um, the second, the second um, act is to reduce the costs and administrative burdens of health care by creating standard electronic formats for many administrative transactions that were previously on paper. So um, in Minnesota, they have a law, there's eight insurance companies that actually have companies in Minnesota, and they cannot send a, a list of their payments by mail. All, all, and they cannot, ex, they're not supposed to accept any um, billing by mail. It all has to be exchanged electronically. So we had a maid, you know, someone couldn't pick something out of the mail, open it up, and it's, oh, here's a medical assistance uh, list for Havenwood Care Center, and it's got, a, you know, 60 people listed and all of their MA numbers on it. So all that has to be done electronically, and that's part of this act. Um, the next thing is to help uh, to develop standards and requirements to protect the privacy and security of health information. And that's mostly what I'm going to be talking about today because we're a healthcare facility. We have to be very mindful while we're working of what we can share about people and what we can't. <coughs> um, so this, these rules apply to healthcare plans. So like um, Blue Cross Blue Shield or Medica or Medicare or medical assistance, any kind of health care plan, they have to be the same as us, be very mindful about what can be shared and what isn't. Um, health care providers, we're a provider, so it's us in hospitals and anybody who provides health care. Health care clearinghouse, so that would be a company who does billing, like our claims would go to a clearinghouse and then on to an insurance company. And so the clearinghouse has to follow all the same rules, making sure that none of that information gets leaked out. So what information is protected? Um, no matter what form it takes, such as notes on a medical chart, health information in a computer, or verbal discussions about a patient's condition, any identifiable health information becomes protected health information under HIPAA. Um, a covered entity such as us may not use or disclose protected health information except, and there are exceptions, um, if the individual authorizes in writing that we can give out their information. Um, as the HIPAA privacy rule permits or requires, we can disclose um, we can disclose it to the individual or we can talk to their authorized representative. And does anybody in here can you tell me how we know who who about a resident can we talk to that's an authorized representative? How do we know? Who's that? The face sheet. Absolutely. When a resident comes in, they list on the face sheet who they are allowing us to give their information to. So, who can see a face sheet? 
LPNs, RNs. LPNs, RNs. Management, social Management, art. right. So, nurses aides, do you mm -hmm. see a face sheet? No. So, who can you give information to? Nobody. Nobody. Right. Same with dietary. You don't see a face sheet, so you don't know who you can give it to. So, if somebody's husband, somebody's spouse, you know, somebody's spouse or their children or whatever come in and ask you a question, you have to say, I'm sorry, you'll have to go to the LPN or the RN or, um, you know, the business office or, you know, you'll have to direct them somewhere else. And if it's about their health inf information, I would say the RN or the LPN. Go to, it's just direct them to go to their station and they uh, will handle it handle it there, okay? Um, so we can share information for treatment, for payment, and for our healthcare operations. So um, when we're looking at getting a resident, we get information from a hospital fax to us, and that's okay because we could be possibly treating that resident. So they need to share with us what is it about that resident that you know we need to take care of so we can be prepared and make a decision on do we, can we handle that resident or can we not handle that resident. Um, so we can, for payment, so when I send in billing, I have, I, I have their diagnosis codes on the payment. It doesn't, it's not in writing to say what they have, so I don't know usually what it is, but on the claim form, it's got these codes on there that, so who puts that in? Well, she here. Kathy? I Kathy. Kathy. <laughs> yeah. So Kathy puts all the diagnosis codes in for the residents, and then she indicates um, the primary, and it flows onto my claim forms, and that goes, goes in on the claims. So we can share that. For operations, so do we still, do we still put little tickets on the tables or have little tickets for meals? Yeah. Yeah, and so there is information on those tickets and we need that for the operation so that everybody gets the right meal. So we can we can use those. And when they're done, they need to go and shred it. Not just in a general garbage, they need to go in the shredding box. If you have questions as we're going along, just stop me and ask me, okay? Covered entities are required to provide patients with a notice of the privacy practices and make a good faith effort to obtain a patient's written acknowledgement of receiving the notice. And that's in our admission packet. So whenever we get a resident that they sit down with, Heather, the social worker, and she's got this big, thick folder of all the pieces of paper that we need to go over the, with the resident, and one of them is the privacy notice. And they have to sign the bottom saying that we gave, it, gave the notice to them. Um, and there are several things that must be on the notice, and um, so we have, we have all that. I did just in light, I did um, find that Minnesota has kind of developed a standard notice, and so I think we should take a look at that and possibly just change our notice. So we'll do that. Um, the patients have a right to their medical information, and um, it tells what our responsibilities are with respect to their information. Patient access. Except in certain circumstances, individuals have the right to review and obtain copies of their health information. So has anybody been to the clinic lately? I have, and they said, okay, would you like to log on to see your information? And so they gave me, um, web, you know, they gave me a little thing saying, this is, this is how you log on and you can view your health information. Um, we're not that sophisticated, but if they want to look at their information, they need to fill out a form telling us what it is they want to look at and sign, sign it, and then give us time to gather that information 
and then uh, give it to them. We can also charge a fee for making copies and that kind of thing. Um, other uses of PHI, protected health information. As a general rule, covered entities may not use or disclose PH, PHI for any purpose other than treatment, payment, and health care. Um, so we really can't give a list of our residents to any other company and say, okay, Mr. You know, dental provider, these are all of our residents, go ahead and solicit them to see if they want to come to your dentist's office. We can't really, you know, we can't do that unless we get their written permission. Um, so we need to have safeguards in place so that um, people can't get access to the information. So we have a privacy officer, I guess that'd be me. Um, we have to train all of our workforce members on our policies and procedures, and so when we have a new person coming in, part of your package should talk about um, um, privacy, the residents' privacy, and what we can disclose and what we can't. Um, our business associates also need to understand that they need to protect our information. So like um, the therapy department, that's a different company and they log into our stuff and we do that for treatment purposes because they're providing therapy to our residents. So so they, as, as a healthcare um, partner with us, have to make sure their staff are trained on privacy issues also. Um, this, this piece has been added after 1996, the, the laws kind of went in um, stages, and there's uh, security is the second part of it. So we have to designate a security officer, and I guess that's me. Um, ensuring computers are secure from intrusion. So when you're using your computers at the desk, never, ever, ever give out the password unless you're training someone. But, um, you know, and the computers are not to be used for fun stuff. <laughs> so to get on our computers, you have to know the password to get on. And I'm just saying, don't ever give that out unless you are training someone who's going to be working in, you know, and needs to be on the computer. So our, our software that we have, um, Achieve Matrix, is wonderful. And everybody has to have their own password to get in there. And it changes every 60 days. And now they're making it, you can make it more secure, which I did check that. So just watch for, um, now they're going to make you, you know, numbers and letters and caps and lowercase and you know all that kind of stuff it's going to be the industry is moving to not just having a password it's moving to having something that is nobody can guess and it has a lot of different aspects to it um, we have a firewall we have a um, a server in the front office that has a microsoft firewall and that gets updated all the time and so April, our um, contact for our, our information is uh, assured me that we have a very, very secure firewall. It's one of Microsoft's, I mean, Microsoft has a marvelous firewall and it works really well. So, feel confident about that. Um, we have different levels of access to our information. If you're a charge nurse, you've got a lot of information that you have access to and it's like totally different from us in the business office because we would not need to see any orders, we would not to see any nurses notes, you know, we, we don't have access to that kind of thing. We have access to something different, like they're 
their face sheet, and um, we would have billing information. So any of the nursing department wouldn't have billing information. So our, our um, software is set up really nice where you have access to what you need. And we can also print out audit reports from our software to say, oh, okay, let's pick a person and just see what all they access today and what time and what, cha what did they change. We can do that, okay? Physical safeguards, um, you have to have physical steps to ensure that your computers are protected. Let's see, <clears throat> safeguards on your hardware and software, and even just thinking about which way is your computer screen turned. Is it at the station where someone can look over your shoulder and see, or is it kind of hidden? So even think about that, okay? Um, Technical safeguards, the security rule requires certain technical safeguards. Information is on a need to know basis. There's audit controls, uh, controls to help ensure that the health data has not been altered in any unauthorized manner. Whenever uh, the nursing staff make a change in our software, it identifies who did it. So, it, you know, anytime you add a nurse's note, it automatically says it's from you. Anytime you make a change, it identifies who made the change. We are really lucky to have this wonderful software. A lot of nursing homes don't. <clears throat> okay, we have to have controls in place to ensure that the data is sent to the intended recipient and received by the intended party. And um, we try not to do much for emailing. Um, in order to email now, it's supposed to be encrypted if you have a resident information on there. And so we have been, um, I know me, I kind of changed to fax, but we, that's one thing we have been talking about for the last few months is encrypted emails. We would have to set up a, um, so set that up so that we can send encrypted emails, okay? Compliance and enforcement. The HIPAA regulations are completely in effect, so they're not in stages anymore. It's We're at the end of the um, implementation plan, and so all of our rules need to be in place to comply with the privacy and security rules. Uh, there's penalties if you don't, and so, um, <coughs> anyway, we're just um, glad that we have a lot of steps in place where we comply with this. Okay, so that's the end of the HIPAA. Is there any questions about things that you maybe see or have questions on? Are we doing something right or what could we make better? Uh, if not, I'm going to run and grab my uh, Medicare fraud sheet. the Medicare fraud sheet. <clears throat> so this is another one that is required for all of our people. And um, you know, it's not really likely that we're going to come in contact with much Medicare fraud, but it does have some really main points. Um, Medicare fraud has become just a really big business in places and the government is really trying to crack down making it um, really tough for uh, people's information to be shared 
They're making it tough on if you apply to become a Medicare provider. A, there's evidently fake Medicare providers out there who are billing Medicare um, for things that never happened. And so it's a nationwide push to let's get this under control. And the first step is with each and every individual. Do not give out your social security number. Do not give out your birthday. You know, just be very protective of your own insurance numbers. Your probably probably not very many people have Medicare numbers, but you know, Medicare, Social Security, insurance numbers, birthday. Just be very very mindful of who you're giving those out to. And I know you have to. You have to give them to the bank, you know, you have to give them to any health care place you go, but if someone calls on the phone, obviously, you're not going to give those out. So that is one big way where everybody can participate and be mindful that they're not giving out that information. Watch for schemes. Um, it, okay, just walk away. If someone approaches you in a parking lot and you know, here's a free phone, if I can have your Medicare number, duh, don't. <laughs> just walk away. Or when you get a phone call, just hang up the phone. Don't try and reason with them or anything, just hang up the phone. Um, the next thing is to check your medical bills. Every time you get a bill from a hospital or clinic or whatever, go through it. And you know, it doesn't, it's not very descriptive anymore because of the Medicare or because of HIPAA, they don't really say on there what they did. You know, it's um, lab charges or miscellaneous charges. But so it's kind of hard to tell if that was something they did for you or not. But be sure and check the dates. Were there charges for you on a date that you weren't in a healthcare facility? Just double check that and we'll be miles ahead. On the back of the sheet, if, if you have any um, concerns about maybe you um, think you might want to record something, or anyway, that have got the phone numbers and um, contact information in case you feel that you've encountered this problem. Are there any questions on that? Okay. All right. We'll move on to Candace and I got it. Why don't you click that and get it started? And I'll just Alrighty. Um, so the second half of the in service is going to be about customer service realms, and this is something that's new to all of us, and um, it's a part of our PIP project. Um, I'm sure everybody here has heard about our PIP project. We had our in service several months back, and. This project is focusing on falls and pain. And one of the steps for our project is implementing these customer service rounds. And Candace will review what customer service rounds are and then talk about how we're going to implement these in the various departments within our facility. And there'll be time to ask questions afterwards. Um, we won't be implementing these immediately. We're, we're working on some of the, the details, talking to the department heads. We'll be talking to each one of the um, different departments individually. And it'll be kind of a trial and, and error um, pro process to get these implemented. But it'll, it should be very beneficial for our residents and help us to improve both pain and falls. So, uh, Candace, explain a little bit. So all you have to do is just yep, that one and it goes on to the next one. Customer service rounds. Um, why we're going to be doing them is to fulfill our mission here at the facility, um, to meet our commitments, respect, recognize, and respond. Our overall goal is to provide the highest quality of care and enhance the satisfaction of all individuals entrusted to our care. It's a systematic method that we'll be using to 
address the needs of the people that we serve, and to assure that they are comfortable, safe, and have all their immediate needs met. It's a standard of practice to ensure that each resident in the facility be checked on by staff at hourly intervals. Every hour at set intervals, staff will interact with and observe each resident for the potential needs according to the four P's, which are pain, position, personal needs, and placement. If the resident is sleeping when you go in to do the rounds, um, you can just actively observe for potential needs in the environment. Um, you may need to wake the resident if that is um, indicated on their care plan. Um, staff should anticipate resident needs and observe for their well-being. If a resident reports pain or a change in the usual condition um, is observed, the nurse must be notified. Who is responsible? Um, as you can see, I think um, everyone here at the facility will be responsible for doing these rounds. Um, all staff are responsible. The procedure is um, going to be greeting the resident and then the four P's that we went over and observing the environment and then um, exiting the resident's room. Greeting, what you're going to do is you're going to want to knock on the door prior to entering um, the resident's room. You want to ask them for their permission to enter. Um, you want to go ahead and make eye contact with them. You want to introduce yourself and your position. There's an example sentence here. Um, Hello, Ruth. My name is Greg, and I am the dietary aide. Um, you want to smile, convey your sincerity. Um, inform the resident what you're doing. Use key phrases such as, I'm here to make sure you have everything you need and that you are my priority today. The four key areas, um, pain, you can ask the resident, are you comfortable? You can look for nonverbal signs of pain as well if they're in the room and they're moaning or they're crying or if they just verbally say that they're not comfortable. Um, you want to make sure to let the appropriate um, staff know the charge, um, charge RN or the LPN. Um, position, um, may I assist you in moving in better um, chair, observe for position for comfort. Um, another thing is for safety as well, if their legs are hanging out of the bed or they're too close to one edge of the bed or um, certain things like that. If it's not your scope of practice, if you're not a CNA, an LPN or RN, you're going to, um, we have a sheet that you will write on, or you can put the resident's light on as well and alert staff that way. Otherwise, we do have a sheet that staff will fill out letting, um, letting the appropriate staff know what needs to be done. Personal needs, do you need to, you know, do they need to use the bathroom or do they need their water glass filled? Um, and then just placement, uh, is there anything I can get for you? Observe for placement of personal items, such as their remote control, um, cell phone, call light, tissue, um, anything that they might need. Assessing the environment would be just checking their room for any safety concerns, such as um, making sure their safety devices are in place, if they have a floor mat that's supposed to be next to them when they're in bed and it's leaning up against the wall and they're in bed, it would be like putting that device in place. Um, making sure that they have their call light within reach. Certain residents don't have call lights due to safety issues um, with entanglement of the cord. Um, and somehow or another we will um, make you guys aware of who won't have call lights when the time comes. Um, looking for if they have clutter in their room or if the floor is wet. Um, if you do find that a resident has spilled something in their room or their floor is wet, you're going to want to go to housekeeping and get the appropriate supplies. And if you're not familiar with the housekeeping where it's located, you just want to go ahead and ask nursing and they should be able to help you. Um, otherwise, if you could use tissue to clean up the water, um, just what you, you know, do what you need to do to get it cleaned up so that nobody slips on it. Um, upon exiting the residence room, you want to just state to the resident that myself 
or someone else will be back to check on you again. And then you can also just make sure to ask them that, you know, is there anything else they may do for you before I leave your room? Don't just look, say something to the resident. Um, be consistent with times. All departments are actively involved. Inform the resident a staff member will be returning, but do not give a specific time. Incorporate customer service rounds as a standard of practice in the facility. Present with a positive attitude, be an active participant in customer service rounds. Be a role model for staff. Audit and provide feedback and celebrate success. Present positive attitude. You want to recognize that customer service rounds will decrease falls and it will also increase resident satisfaction. Um, the service rounds will also decrease the volume of call aids and they will also um, be a standard of practice and an expectation of all staff here in the facility. And customer service rounds are everyone's responsibility. We have made a tentative schedule for customer service rounds, and they look kind of like this. The week schedule, Monday through Friday, will look different than the weekend, because we'll have different staff available. Um, we know these probably won't work um, perfectly right off the get-go, but we will be making changes as we go along if changes need to be made. Um, these will be on each wing. We haven't decided where they'll be located at on the wings, but when that time comes, we'll let you guys know. Um, and then I have a handout here, so I need one for this. So when you figure out when your department is responsible to do these rounds, you need to report to the unit that you're scheduled to be on. And there will be a clipboard. Um, on the clipboard, we'll have the sheet that Brandon's handing out. And it kind of gives the procedure guidelines as to what you need to do on the rounds, what you need to be looking for. And there will also be another sheet where you will write if a resident has an issue, um, such as they need a pain med, they're in pain, they need to be repositioned and you can't do it, or they're hungry, they need a snack, or they need to use the restroom. You can write it down on here so that it's not forgotten. And then this, at the end of the, when you get done doing your rounds, needs to be passed on to the charge LPN or the RN so they can make sure that um, what needs to be done is addressed. And, um, if the resident just needs to go to the bathroom, you can always put the call light on. Um, that's one way of notifying the staff. And then just make sure that it gets followed up with. Um, there will also be another sheet on the clipboard that has um, specific to each ring, or each wing, with the resident's names listed on one side. And 24 hours going across the top. So the sheet will be good for one whole day. And as you go through and do your rounds, next to the resident's name, you'll just do a check mark that you laid eyes on that resident and that everything, you know, that you're sure that all their needs have been met. Um, and then at the bottom of your column for the hour you were responsible for, you will initial and then um, give that, pass it on to the charge LPN or RN to verify that the round was completed and they'll sign under your initial. So, and we're still in the process of um, making that form. So. The sheet we just handed out um, just explains the procedure. You wanna knock on the resident's door, um, state your name, your position, who you are, and that you're there to do customer service rounds. Um, wait for the invite for them to allow you to come in. Um, there will be times when the resident is sleeping. In most cases, you don't have to wake them up, but you just want to observe um, for the four P's that we had originally talked about. Um, first thing you want to just look for is posi position of the resident. Do they appear in a comfortable position? Are they safe where they're at? You know, making sure their legs are hanging out of the bed and that they're positioned in the middle of the bed or um, not scooting out of their wheelchair. You'll find a lot of residents who are 
just getting really close to the edge of the wheelchair. Um, so if they need repositioning and you're not a nursing um, staff member, you want to um, try to get somebody as fast as you can, you know, to help you if it's a safety concern. Um, otherwise, you can always write down if it's just a general repositioning that they need, you can write down on the concern sheet. Um, pain, you want to look for verbal and nonverbal signs of pain. There is, at the bottom of the sheet we just handed out, there is the numeric pain intensity scale, which mostly nursing will use, I would say, but um, there is a good list of nonverbal signs on there um, that you can look at to see if the resident is displaying any of those. Um, if they are having pain or they're uncomfortable, you need to let the nurse know. Um, you'll also want to write it down on the concern sheet so that we know that it's been followed up with and the nurse will sign off when it's been completed that they have received something. Uh, personal needs, does a resident need to use the restroom? Do they need to have a glass filled with water? Um, and that's another thing. Um, you can either put the call light on or you can write it on here that they need to use the restroom. Certain residents have special diets, so if they ask for something to drink, um, if they have a pink mug and they have regular fluid, that's fine for you to go ahead and fill. But if they have a plastic clear cup, which means they probably have like a thick and liquid of like nectar or honey, um, you would want to go and have the nursing staff um, fill that beverage so that they get the appropriate texture. Um, personal needs, or we just move that. Placement, uh, is there anything I can get for you observing to make sure that they have their bedside table, their remote, their Kleenexes, their cell phone, um, things like that, making sure they have them close by. Assessing the environment, just making sure there's not a lot of clutter, there's nothing they can trip on, there hasn't been anything spilled on the floor, um, things like that. And then just exiting the resident's room, just reassuring that somebody will be back um, to check on them soon. And you can always ask if there's anything you can get them before you leave. So, um, I think that's it. Is there any, any questions on the rounds? I do. Um, so, this is a 24 hour. So, this is going to happen overnight, yeah. too. And I'll be done by the nursing staff because there's no other departments that are here. Yep, right. it'll be all nursing. Yeah. And I have a question, another one. Okay, you said in reference to somebody's leg thing over the bed. There are at least three residents I know that legs stay over the bed when they're sleeping. And that's the way they prefer to be. Mm -hmm. So. You as overnight staff, I feel like you kind of know the residents. Well, no, I'm talking about like day staff too, like Janice Wilson. Okay. Legs are always over the bed. You, you move your legs back and they go right back. So my question is, for some of the departments who don't know these people, as well as let's say we do, yeah. is that making extra work for the nursing staff? If so in situations like that, if you don't know the resident and you reserve that, you need to go and talk to nursing staff and it should be as simple as you just say, well, she prefers to have her leg over the side of the bed. Um, for your other question, a night, on the night shift, um, yeah, there's five, six people in the building doing rounds on the entire building. However, um, as Candace mentioned a couple times, you know, if someone's sleeping, that would be just a, a quick a walk in, you check for safety issues, uh, fall interventions, things like that, and you move on to the next, next room. Are we talking just rooms, or are we going to do the people, like, whatever time I have to do it, if they're up and in the, in the hall? No, we aren't going to have you chase them all over the building trying to find them. So it's primarily in their the rooms. rooms. So you're, you're checking for... You'd still walk into the room and observe for <coughs> safety issues, um, but you would pass on then to the, the next person if there's nobody in that room. I just have one more question. There's going to be some residents who absolutely adore this, and there's going to be some that absolutely hate it. Okay. Somebody coming into the room every hour. 
Are we going to make adjustments for those residents who request, who get agitated with us going in there every hour? And we'll have to wait and see how it goes. I don't think there will be too many Maybe. residents that are like that, and you don't have to wake them. You're just peeking in on them to make sure that they're safe. They're not moaning or uncomfortable. Um, Nellie, for instance, isn't going to like somebody coming in her room every hour. We can mm -hmm. care plan that she okay. not have it during sleeping hours. That's always a possibility. Or let it be put sign up. Way better than you don't want to be wake up. Yeah. On well, housekeeping is already going in there to see if there's water on the floor. See, why should we be doing the extra stuff? Because That's already because in there's there. four parts to this. It's not only the water on the floor. It's asking them if they're comfortable, if they have everything they need. Um, we don't know about the pain stuff. We're, we're not supposed to, that's not our job. It's the nurses and the aides maybe, but I don't see the housekeeping doing that part. What it, what's your I mean, response? You just ask somebody if they are having a pain today and then let the, the, you can see, see it. They say, yeah, get up. If I see something moaning and groaning and nobody's doing nothing about it, I will say something. Yeah, and just put the light down or something. Mm -hmm. We're expecting once the residents get used to these customer service rounds, they will go quickly. A lot of your residents will be resting. A lot of them won't be in their room. They'll be down with activities or at therapy. Um, you've got your nursing assistants doing their rounds on every every two hours, on the even hours, so those. Um, sometimes they'll be out for meals. Um, it'll just be a quick check-in, make sure that everything is safe. They don't is it already being done, that you're just adding more? No, it's not being done. Not every it's hour. It's not being done in this, it's not being done in this manner. Mm -hmm. you know, we, do, we don't go in and directly ask about these four Ps. Um, this, the purpose of this is to try to prevent the situation that could <coughs> cause a fall, or to prevent the resident from they are having pain, they have to wait until the next nursing round. Right now we do um, generally every two hour rounds in nursing. And so now we'll be doing them every hour. And, you know, basically, for if you look at the schedule, and Candace hasn't passed that around, and I don't think we will today because it isn't 100% finalized. But, you know, for all the other departments, basically what you're looking at is one round a day. At, at the most, there might be two rounds a day. And so for example, in housekeeping and laundry, you have three staff on in the morning. Um, at certain hour, you would go out, each staff person would take a different wing, and you would be responsible for that customer service round on that wing. We, you see it taking approximately 15 Questions? Mm -hmm. It reminds me of the room checks we used to do a long time ago. Pretty much the same thing. Yeah. So a lot of times what we find is, you know, we've asked a couple of times, you know, are we going to be chasing them all over the facility looking for them? Those generally aren't the residents that are falling. You know, it's, it's the ones that are in their room and nobody's checked on them and asked them these things in the last hour or so. And just by us simply going in there and trying to be proactive and asking these four Ps, hopefully we'll be able to prevent some of these things. Does anybody here have extra time? Do a little bit less visiting. Mm -hmm. It's true, I know. Well, LPN, be responsible for an hour to do this too. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, the weekend schedule differs from the weekday schedule because there's more a loss. Yeah. Um, so there will be less of that during the week, but there are some 
some more um, realms for the LPMs and RMs and all the things. So maybe in the weekend you have the RM do the facial work yeah. because Sony are in the alternate. I even do it in the weekend, but Sony don't. Right. Okay. On the weekends, the RN will be doing a round, um, one round earlier in the morning on North, and then another round later on in the day on Little Way. Is how we have it scheduled now. If you have questions or suggestions, talk to Candace or Ashley or myself or your department head. Um, like you said, this will be a work in progress. Mm -hmm. Do we have like a tentative start date at all? Well, I would say within the probably by the first of December is our goal. Um, we want to. We have two more in services, um, and we want to make sure we get uh, as many people as possible before we start. Another thing I didn't mention is that it's not always going to work out perfectly and there's going to be times when things come up and you uh, just can't make it to do the rounds when you're scheduled to do them. In that case, you need to either go to Ashley, myself, or Brandon and we do have people um, set aside to go out and fill in when need be. So. Thank you.